Good morning, church. Hey, it's so fun to be here uh, today. And, uh, you know, I, we, my wife and I live in Orange County, but Sacramento's where it's at, man. Like, this, like if we could move, I, like, Orange County is just boring. Like, there's just, you know, everything looks the same. People look the same. It's all fake, you know. Sacramento's where it's at, right? Uh, we're so excited just to be here and, and just be with Caleb and Christy. We love what they're doing. We love how they're just, uh, uh, just kind of a new church in the city and just believe in what they're doing, believe in the vision. And we really believe that God's going to do some incredible stuff here in Sacramento. So we're honored to be here. I'm honored to be here. And, uh, and we get to talk to you a little bit today um, about Palm Sunday. But as Caleb said, you know, um, I, I do something called Project Europe, and it's just been a huge passion. And I feel like I just want to tell a little of my story uh, just to encourage you, because I believe there's some other people in here that need to take a step of faith for what God has for you next. And so for me, God began stirring in my heart for just the countries in Europe. And as you go to Europe and you see Europe, um, I think almost every single uh, country is under 2% Christian. It's crazy. Some are like, like France is like 0.5. You know, and so here's this place that once used to be this apex uh, of where the church started. And yet, uh, as you go there, you'll see the church dead and dying. And so God just began to stir in my heart for this country. And so, you know, I, I was, I, I was, I've been a pastor for 18 years. I was, last 10 years, I was on staff at a church called Mariner's Church. And, and it's kind of like, you know, when you, when, you, when you go to pastor school and you think about a church and those kinds of things, it's kind of like, that's like the place to arrive, right? You know, it's like the mega church, 19,000 people, a big campus, you know, all these kinds. And I'm like, this is it, right? And God just began to stir in me and just go, man, I want to use you in different ways. And he put my, on my heart just for just Europe. And so I began to just wrestle with this. What does it mean to kind of leave this comfort and safety and, and to step out into something bold? And so my wife and I made a decision. We said, okay, you know what? If God is who he says he is, and we actually believe we heard his voice, then we have to step out into this. And I believe that there are people in this room today that, that God has been stirring in your life to step out into something. And, and here's the thing is I had, as a pastor, I had to wrestle with, God, do I actually believe that you have this, that you're bigger than my fears, that you're bigger than this, and God, I'm going to hold on to you with everything I got, or, or, or do I want to stay in, in this box and be safe and, and not risk and not step into and not hold on to you? And so I stepped out, and what's amazing is I didn't know how it's going to work. How, how can a guy from America help the church in Europe? Like, I didn't, like, it's crazy. And yet at the end of the year, uh, we got to meet with about 89 churches in 15 different countries and work with about 500 leaders. God is good. That had nothing to do with me. All I did is said, okay, God, I'll take a step. And I believe that God wants to stir in some of you guys today just to take a step in what he's been encouraging you to do. So what we're, here, we're not here to talk about that. We're going to talk about Palm Sunday. And I noticed that when Chrissy said it's Palm Sunday, the response in the room was like this. Like, some of you are like, I don't even know what it is. Like, Palm Sunday, you know, it's like, I grew up in a Lutheran church, and it was like, oh, it's the Sunday where they pass out palm branches, and like, you wave them during worship, you know? Like, what's Palm Sunday? And yet, when Caleb talked about Easter, it's like, yeah, it's Easter next week. And so, Palm Sunday is kind of this land in between, right? It's not Good Friday, it's not Easter, it's not Christmas. It's like, what is it? Like, like, like how do we come into this Palm Sunday? What does this actually mean? And, and so, you know, uh, I'm, if I'm honest with you, uh, I have a little bit of a confession to make that that was my mindset too. I was like, you know, what am I going to talk about palm branches uh, on Sunday? Like, that's not encouraging, is it? Like, you know, how is this going to work? Like, Easter's the where it's at. Good Friday's where it's at. Like, Palm Sunday, like, how do we talk about that? And, and so what was amazing for me is as I entered in this journey, as God often does, is he just really stirred in me that I believe that he's got an amazing word for you this morning. I really believe that, that today you're going to walk out of here completely changed as you enter into this next week. Because this is, I mean, Palm Sunday is so much bigger than a bunch of palm branches. It's so much bigger than, than what we think it's going to be. It's kind of like the other sun, the Sunday before Easter. It's actually one of the apex launching points into one of the biggest weeks that we believe in. And so what I want to do is if you're kind of like me, you're kind of going, it's Palm Sunday, so what, you know? Um, I, here's what I want to do is I just want to walk you through and paint this picture of what today actually is, okay? Can I do that with you? 
And as we paint that picture of what today is, I want to give you a couple things to think about because I believe that next week is going to be a week that forever changes your life. I believe that the city is going to be different because of what's going to happen because of you in this church next week. And so I'm excited. I'm intis- I can't wait to hear the stories because this is a week that's going to be incredible. But I want to paint the picture of what this week was and give you a couple ways to think about it as you go into it, okay? Can we do that? Yeah. Let me pray for you guys. Lord, we thank you for just the story that we get to be a part of. Lord, we thank you for uh, what you've done for us, that it wasn't about what we did, it's about what you did. And Lord, as we think about this week, Lord, I pray that we can just remember, that we can hold on to what it means to believe in you, what it means to say, I'm a follower of you. And so, Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for this week. Lord, I pray right now that you just allow your Holy Spirit just to come into this place and just stir. Lord, would you just move? Would you just have your way with the people in this room? Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to jump in, and we're going to talk about, you know, uh, Palm Sunday. And and there's it's one of the stories that appears in all four Gospels. And so I'm just going to kind of try to give you guys context as a storyteller for what was happening at that place before we get into kind of, you know, the action steps. Some of you are just like, you know, just give me the action steps so I can go, you know, but we're going to actually immerse ourselves in the story uh, as best we can. And so it's found in all four Gospels, uh, but we're going to stick in Matthew because Matthew, I like the name Matthew, it's kind of cool. Uh, Matthew 21 verses 1 through 11. And so this is the story of, of Palm Sunday, and let me give you kind of a context for what's happening as they enter into this, is it going to come up here? Or the first one? Great. Oh, I can see it right there. Never mind. Um, so here's what's going to happen. It's, it's, it's really kind of the Passover celebration. And the Passover celebration was a time that the people remembered that God rescued them from Egypt, rescued them out of slavery. So it's really the Passover celebration is a celebration of freedom, kind of like the 4th of July. It's like our independence. It's like it's our freedom. Hey, in, in, in the Old Testament, it says, remember what God has done for you today. And so they estimate that roughly anywhere from 200,000 to 2.7 million people made a journey into Jerusalem to celebrate this week. I mean, that's a party, right? I mean, that's like the ultimate 4th of July party, right? I mean, it's like 2.7 million. I mean, when do you see that happen? And yet, so, you know, when you think about making, if you guys go on vacation, if you plan a party, if you plan a celebration, there's so much planning that goes into it. I mean, last night had to take almost six months to a year to plan, right? I mean, you think about 2.7 million people, they got to figure out where they're going to stay. They got to save up money for the journey. I mean, they're all they're thinking about is, man, I can't wait to get to the celebration, the Passover celebration. And so the city is filled with people that want to party and they want to celebrate and they want to, they want to sacrifice and they want to remember what God has done. And it was kind of that moment that they entered into. It was like the, the thing they looked most forward to throughout the whole year. It was a thing that marked their, their faith. And so people are traveling into Jerusalem. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's like the Super Bowl, as Caleb met. It's like the Super Bowl that's happening. And, you know, and... and um, my, my daughter just turned 10 uh, a couple weeks ago, and it was like her double-digit birthday, right? So if you know my wife, Bian- how many of you guys met my wife, Bianca, last night, right? She's like the Mexican crazy, like, you know, talks with her hands, and I'm kind of like the stoic German, you know, this is my excited face, you know, this is my angry face, you know, it doesn't move, right? So my daughter's turning 10, and so her and my daughter just, like, they connected. They love glitter. They love sparkles. They love fashion. Like, my daughter would have been like, this is amazing fashion. Like, she would have been here in the front row. But they were like, we got to plan this party. And she wanted to do this theme, this red carpet theme. So here's my daughter turning 10, and, like, every day for, like, two months, they would come home and go, Papa, we need a new dress. Papa, we need to get our nails done. Papa, we need to get our hair done. We need new shoes to match. I mean, like, they planned this party for two months, right? And so think about this week, going into Passover, how much we plan for parties and to celebrate. Because I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But there's all this planning and celebration that goes into this week. And so then we see in Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11, I'm just going to read this and kind of unpack it for you, what's happening as as this goes on. Jesus had just finished 
um, with Lazarus. Uh, if you know the story of Lazarus, he raised him from the dead. So, I mean, I mean, there isn't a greater miracle than that, right? I mean, he's like he raised somebody from the dead. There's this large crowd following Jesus into the city, right? So there's, I mean, just think about it. I mean, close your eyes and picture. Here's this guy that raises somebody from the dead. It'd be like, you know, if the Sacramento Kings, I mean, like miracles, right? If the Sacramento Kings win the NBA championship, miracles, right? Um, The city would be like going, I mean, like, they would have a parade. They'd be walking into, this is miraculous. They won. I mean, we can't believe it, right? You know? So they're walking in, and so it's, this crowd is following Jesus. And they're like, man, this is amazing. And so Jesus comes in in verse 1, and he says, As they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethage on the, on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with a colt by her side. Untie them and bring them to me, and if anyone says anything to you, say to the Lord, say the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Zechariah. Say to the daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey. And on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. And so it's really important that we, this, that the Palm Sunday is really this prophetic moment of Jesus stepping into. There would have been no doubt that he is proclaiming to be the Messiah as he comes into the city. And so remembering Palm Sunday is remembering that this is a prophetic statement. This is a prophetic event of Jesus claiming that he is is the Messiah. And most of the people in the city would have known this. And especially the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And so he gets on, so he says when, um, uh, verse 10, or no, verse uh, 6, the disciples did what Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. The very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while the others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. And asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And and, and so here you have this moment. And and just to kind of, you know, just kind of set the tone and kind of unpack the situation. The crowds are yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us now. And so you think about it, you know, they take off their jackets, they lay them down on the road. They got branches. These branches represent peace and victory. And so, like, this is almost like something from the gladiator when, like, a guy comes back from, like, a military victory, isn't it? You know, it's like he's got the horses, he's got the chariots, we got this red carpet for him, we've got the palm branches that symbolize, you know, um, victory and peace. And so here comes this king into the city. And it's really amazing to see what happens. Is you know, the city is like, it's so loud. It'd be like, you know, again, if the Sacramento Kings won the NBA championship, um, you know, this place would be alive. This place would be rumbling. The walls would be shaking. There would be a, everybody would be talking about it. And yet, in that day, they didn't have Twitter. They didn't have Instagram. They didn't have Snap the chat, you know, all the Periscope, you know, all those kinds of things, right? You know, I just aged myself. My wife loves that. I, I'm like, I don't even know what it is. You know, they didn't have all, they didn't have news stations. They didn't have radio stations. They didn't have any of these things. And, and can you imagine that it was so loud that the entire city, remember, 200,000, two point, I mean, there's thousands and thousands of people of them. Every, it says, it doesn't say half the city. It says the whole city was stirred. The whole city stopped what they're doing to say, what the heck is going on outside the walls of Jerusalem? I mean, can you imagine such an event? And, and what's even crazy is you look at some of the other translations um, in, uh, in Luke. Uh, Luke tells a story, and, and he tells a story. The Pharisees are at the scene, and, and everybody's shouting, you know, this is, this is Jesus. He's the king. And, and the Pharisees are like, Stop saying that. Don't do that. Stop celebrating. Don't sell. Cel- this can't be true. And they're trying to stop this. And Jesus says this. I love this. I love this line. Like, just imagine 
like the smirk on Jesus' face, right? He's like, you know, if I tell him to stop, the rocks will sing. You know what I mean? It's like, he's, and basically what he's saying is, man, you can't contain me. Man, you know, my, my power is not predicated on your praise. I, I am who I am, and you know what? Creation is going to worship me. This is a moment in history you don't understand. And yet he's saying the rocks and creation are going to worship the king coming into Jerusalem. And so this is, the, this is kind of the, the, the situation of Palm Sunday. A little bit more dramatic than just the palm branches and just kind of that other Sunday before Easter. This was the beginning. This was the launching. This was, this was inviting everybody to say, we're going to go on a journey this week. And it's going to change your life. You see, there's no other week on the face of the planet that has transformed as many lives as this week that's coming up. I mean, this week ha- has brought people into, from darkness into light. This has brought people from death into being alive. I mean, this, people has, this week has redeemed. This week has restored. This week has saved because this is the apex of the story of the gospel. And yet we think about how do we enter into this next week? And, and let me give you an example. It's referred to as Passion Week. And, and you know, my wife, when I told her, it's like, you know, it's Palm Sunday. What should I talk about? She's like, oh, my gosh, it's Palm Sunday. This is amazing. And she's like, you know, she's all excited. I'm like, whoa, okay, like, you know, like I didn't, I mean, so like, but yet it's Passion Week. And I think of passion, I go, my wife is, she's like kind of the passionate person I know, right? And so it's called Passion Week for a reason. Because it should stir us, because it should inspire us, because it should be an invitation into the greatest story on the face of the planet. It should be an invitation into the story that has transformed millions and millions and millions of lives. And yet, our response was, and I'm with you because I was there, when they said it's Palm Sunday, we were like, yeah, okay, the week before Easter. And yet it's this invitation into Passion Week. And so you think about what happens this week. The Lord's Supper happens this week. Jesus washes his disciples' feet this week. Jesus predicts his death this week. He gives the greatest commandment on the face of the planet in Matthew 22. He promises the Holy Spirit. He says, remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He prays for all believers and his disciples everywhere to be united. And it says, because of your unity, we are going to change the world. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He prays, God, if, if there's any other way. And, and he sweats blood as he's praying so intensely. And yet it's this moment of ultimate surrender, but it's not my will, it's your will. He's arrested. He's beaten. He's crucified. He conquers death on Saturday and ultimately rises from the dead to be the resurrected king. That's this week. That's the invitation this week. And and if you're like me, I went into this week, I haven't thought one bit about how my life is going to be different, about how I'm going to celebrate, about how I'm going to plan for this week. I didn't even think about it. And yet, it it took a story. um, I was in uh, the grocery store. I'm a huge uh, proper football fan, which is referred to in America as soccer. And... um, you know, and so uh, I love this team from Germany because I have German heritage. They're called Bayern Munich. And they play like in the Super Bowl of, you know, like it's like the soccer Super Bowl, right? It's the Champions League. And they have a game on, on like Wednesday, midweek. And because it's in Europe, it's on at like lunchtime, right? So here's me that plans my entire day to get done with meetings before the game, put on my jersey, get some chips and salsa, and sit in my living room by myself and watch this game, right? This is my Wednesday. So I'm running back from, from the church, and I'm running back, and, and I stop at Albertsons, and I'm like, man, I got 15 minutes. I grab a bag of chips. I grab some salsa. You know, I grab some, I grab some uh, soda water. I grab, I'm like, just, I'm, what am I going to sandwich? I grab a sandwich, and this guy stops me, and he goes, and I have my jersey, and he goes, you know, hey, is that Manchester United? I said, man, really? Like, you're going to, like, that's like the enemy. Really? That's not man. This is like a German team. You know? And then he, I turn around, and he proceeds to tell me this story about how, 
he played soccer in the Special Olympics. And I'm annoyed, you know? I'm annoyed because I got 10 minutes to get to the house for the start of the game because I got to celebrate. I mean, like, I, I, I'm annoyed. And, like, I try to kind of, and this is me confessing to you, I try to kind of keep moving along, you know, and, like, I got to go look at something else over here. And, and this guy, his name is Jay. Jay keeps following me. And he's like, man, I played soccer in the Special Olympics. And I'm just like, I mean, I'm, I feel like at this mo- moment in time, finally, I'm like, I go, I got to go down this aisle, Jay. And he's like, you know what? Have a great Easter. And it just stopped me. It just stopped me in my tracks. Because he gets it and I didn't. He's so excited, 10 days out, that Easter is coming, that he's creating conversations with people in a grocery store where he works to go, hey, guess what? Easter's coming. Guess what? This is going to be the greatest week in the history of the Christian faith. It's coming. Happy Easter. And I was worried about getting home with my chips and salsa to turn on the game. And it was then that I realized that I didn't prepare for this week. Jay got it. I didn't get it. And so what I want to share with you this morning is what's three things you can do to prepare for this week. Because if this is the greatest, if this is the most epic, if this is the best celebration that you've ever been a part of, I wonder if we've thought about how we're going to be different and how we're going to prepare and how we're going to plan for this week. Because the world should be stirred because of the church this week. The world should look at us and go, it's Easter week. It's not about pastel colors and eggs and bunnies. It's about the most life-changing moment on the face of the planet. And that should be our week this week. So how do we prepare for that? And so I want to give you three things that I've kind of approached and thought about as I step into this. The first one is this. Never forget. Never forget. See, the Passover in Exodus 13 is where Moses commands the people, let's never forget what God has done for us. That this is about him saving us. This is about his rescue mission. I remember the first time I watched The Passion of the Christ. Anybody, anybody seen that movie? Some people? A few people, like you're like in your 40s like me, right? Yeah, so totally. We're like aging ourselves back when, you know. But anyway, so but we, I watched that. I remember the first time I watched it, and I come out of the movie, and I go, and God just, it was so strong. He says, don't ever forget. This is a visual story of what I went through that week. Don't ever forget. And, and you think about it. You think about that this is a week that, that we have victory. This is a week that we are rescued. This is a week that we are redeemed. This is a week that we are restored. And how can we not, how can this not change our lives? And, and, and I wonder if, you know, it, you know um, part of my story is uh, um, I had heart surgery probably 10 years ago. I don't know what it looked like it, but I had heart surgery. Really stressed out German, right? You know, so, and, and so I had heart surgery, and, and so I was okay, you know, for the, the heart surgery. And, and just, you know, about last year, my wife, because I travel so much, she insisted. She goes, you know what, we need to get life insurance. And I was like, what are you trying to do? You know, like, you need to increase your life insurance. I'm like, what? You know, like, and she's like, so fine, I, you know, life insurance. And to be honest, I'm like, I, w- I was a little bit fearful of the testing. Because I was like, what is this going to reveal, right? You know, how unhealthy is my life? No more chips and salsa, right? So it's like, you know, so I, so I go through this and I say, okay, finally, it takes me a couple months to get it. The lady comes and tests us and we get these test results. And the test results aren't good. <laughs> it's basically like, you're at high risk for a heart attack. And I'm like, shoot. <laughs> you know, so, but, but here's the point is, this was a life-altering moment for me that it's changed the way I eat, it's changed the way that I sleep, it's changed the way that I exercise, it's changed all aspects of my life. And yet, as you think about this week of the greatest story ever told, the ultimate act of sacrifice about what he did for us, does it really change our lifestyle? And so I want to invite you, as you think about this week, this is a week where the Lord's Supper happens. In 1 Corinthians, it it talks about just kind of walking through the story of, of the Last Supper where Jesus takes the bread and he says, this is my body that was broken for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. And then he says, this is my blood. Shed for you. Drink this in remembrance of me. And it's this moment that that what God is doing is saying, do you remember why you said yes to Jesus in the first place? Do you remember what it means to be a follower of him? Do you remember the story that's happening and unfolding right before your eyes? And so my first thing for you is just to think about how you can never forget what he's done for you this week. It should change your life. It should change your conversations. It should change the way you parent your kids. It should change the way you love your spouse. It should change the way you invite people to this week because this is the greatest story ever told that they get to be a part of. It should change everything. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I want to invite you to live counterculturally. And, and what I mean by this, this is kind of a big word, but everything about Jesus was countercultural. You know, so, and I'll, I'll walk through how Palm Sunday was just that. But, you know, he said, you know, love your enemies. Nobody said that, right? You know, love your enemies. He said the first will be last. He, he said, you know, um, love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, everything Jesus taught was countercultural. And so our lives should look countercultural. We should have more conversations with Jay. You know, and so I remember Jay, Jay made a comment. He goes, man, that's a really nice jersey. And I, and I thought to myself that when I go to a game, I can go to a game. He's like, I've never been to a game. I don't have a jersey. I've never had a jersey. That's a really nice jersey. And so what I did is I went and ordered him a jersey for Manchester United, the, the, the enemy team. <laughs> and it arrives on Monday, and my family... Because we want to be countercultural. We're going to give that jersey to Jay. Just to bless him. Just blessed to be a blessing. And so as you think about this week, man, this should be the week that the city is literally turned upside down because the church is choosing to live countercultural. That you're blessed to be a blessing. That you, you are called to love your neighbor. That you are called to have these conversations with people. That this is about inviting them into this week and into this story. And so I want to invite you. What would it look like for you to live countercultural? What would it look like for you to live in this week differently? And, and you know, and we all have, you know, um, <laughs> there's always that, that neighbor that nobody likes, Right? You know, that's kind of, so last night, last night we're in this, uh, we're staying in the hotel and, um, and we're on like the 11th floor and there's a wedding literally right down below us, right? You know, it's like, talk about the city being like shaking that you can hear like, you know, everything. So we're, and I usually, I can sleep through anything. My wife can. And so I'm like, you know, it's no big deal. And then I lay in bed and I literally can hear like, you know, John Bon Jovi going off song, you know, something else about some other song. And then I can hear the toast, you know, so now I know the, I know their story. I'm like, I'm like, this is ridiculous, right? You know, so, you know, it's like, and so we're just like, man, this is crazy. So we went, you know, we went and got into a different room, but even like the next morning, like we're at breakfast and my wife's like, you know, that's them. That's, I know who they are. I know their names. That's, that's, we know, we know them. Right. And so, you know. There's always those people in your life that you go, man, who, who God is, who is God calling me to love? Man, there's that neighbor that nobody likes. There's that person at your office that you're like, man, they just, all they do is just, you know, they're, they're always on me. They're always, you know, it's my supervisor. I mean, we have those people in our life. And what does it look like to be countercultural to them? Maybe there's some people in this room that God has blessed you, that God has given you resources beyond belief. And what would it look like for you to be generous this week? You know, I walked the streets at 6 a.m. this morning, and there are homeless people after homeless people on the streets. And man, what does it look like to buy a cup of coffee? What does it look like to create a conversation? And so this week should define who we are. It should cause us to live in such a way that the city stops and says, what the heck is going on? And yet this is the invitation 
of what Jesus did in Palm Sunday. You know, he came in as, as a donkey, on a donkey, versus on a horse, and, and, and kind of somebody who was going to have military victory. They chanted, Hosanna, which means save us now. So they thought literally this was the parade going into Jerusalem to overthrow the Roman government. And yet Jesus said, no, that's not what we're going to do. I'm going to die so that you can have life. And so everything Jesus did was countercultural. He turned the world upside down. And so the world tells us to think about us. The world tells us to think about what we need. The, the world tells us to say, to be successful, you've got to get ahead. And yet Jesus is saying, would you live in a different way? Would you live in a way that my name is known among the city, among the nations? Would you live countercultural? The last thing is to let you know that everybody is invited to the party. This is a party that was, I mean, this is like the epic party that was happening in Jerusalem at the time. And, and what's amazing about this party is that, you know, you can't contain Jesus. You can't keep him quiet. He says, you know what, even if, even if people stopped celebrating, even if people stopped rejoicing at the party, the rocks would sing. You can't contain me. I don't need your praise. This is about me being who I am, that I am who I am. And this is about a party that I am throwing, that I am inviting people, everybody into, no matter what. You know, sometimes we think that we have to have everything figured out or we have to be qualified before we can come into the party. And that's not who Jesus was. Jesus called the unqualified. He called the worst of the worst. Right before he came into the city, he was with Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector, one of the most hated people in the whole Jerusalem. And that's who he spent time with. And so some of you are here today going, I don't know if I can come to the party. I don't know if I'm invited to the party. And what Jesus is saying is, this week is for you. This week is about what I wanna do in your life. This is come as you are. This isn't that you don't have the most fashionable clothes. This is that you don't have all the right things. You don't have to have all your ducks in a row. This is about me saying, this is about what I'm going to do this week so that you can have life. This is about me dying on the cross so that you could have, be resurrected. This week is for all of us. And, and here's the thing. I don't want you to miss what God is going to do this week. Because I believe this week that you are going to get to Easter and you are going to hear miracles of what happened if the church is willing to be the church. If the church is willing to invite people in this city to say, you know what, this is the greatest story. We want you to be there. I'll do whatever it takes to get you here. This city is going to be different. You're going to be different. You're going to get to see God move in ways that are just beyond your wildest dreams. People that you never thought would come to church are going to come to church. But here's the thing. It takes you, number one, accepting, accepting that invitation to the party, but two, is you've got to be an inviter to the party. This is about you having compassion, having a heart, but willing to risk whoever is in your life and saying, you know what, you don't want to miss this week. You don't want to miss what God is going to do. You don't want to miss how we get to celebrate who Jesus is. You don't want to miss this story that God is unfolding that we get to be a part of because we're believers in Him. It's this week that Palm Sunday kicks off. And so when I yell, as Chrissy did, it's Palm Sunday, my prayer is that this is, a, this is a, a different response from you as you think about this week. As you think about what Palm Sunday is, that's an invitation into the greatest story. And so I'm gonna ask you again, I'm just gonna say, hey, welcome to Palm Sunday. Yes, yes. It's this week that's going to change this city. And Jesus is alive and well, and he is living in you. And what I want to do right now is I want to pray for two different kinds of people in the room. Some of you are sitting there going, I, I don't know how to be a part of this party. I, I don't know the story that, that Jesus is about. Well, or maybe you came into here thinking, you know what, I had to have some things figured out or I got to do all these things. You know what, guess what? It's not about you, it's about what he did. 
It's come as you are. And so what I want to do right now is I just want to pray for people in this room that if you're not part of this story, if you, don't, if you haven't accepted the invitation, I want to pray for you right now to be a part of the family, to be a part of the journey. I want you to hold on to this week is for you. If you are the only person on this planet, this week is for you. And so wherever you're at, however you came into this space today, I want you just to, to wrestle with this invitation. And if this is something you want to be a part of, if this is a story that matches your story about the, the redeemed becoming the redeemers, about the restored becoming the restorers, about having new life, about hearing the stories last night at Fashion of lives that have been transformed because of the name of Jesus, if that is you, I'm just going to pray for you. If you want to accept that invitation, I just want you to raise your hand. We just want to pray for you in this room. So I want you to think about it. I want you to hold on to it. If you want to be a part of this week, if you want to be a part of this story, if you want to accept Jesus into your life, I just want to invite you just to raise your hand. celebration. This is the day that's going to change this city. This is going to be the one of those incredible journeys you're going to be on. We'll wait for you. If this is you, just raise your hand. You don't want to miss this. You don't want to miss what God is going to do. Amen. Amen. Lord, we just come before you right now we confess with our mouth and we believe in our hearts that you are the God who saves. And Lord, we thank you for dying on the cross for us. Lord, that we can be welcomed into the family because of what you did, not because of what we do. And so Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for these people that have boldly raised their hands to say, I'm in. I want to accept the invitation. Lord, would you just fill them with your Holy Spirit? Remind them how much you love them. And Lord, they get to start into this amazing journey of following you. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to pray for another group of people in this room. Because here's, here's what I believe. I believe that we could come into this space today and we could say, hey, we're going to sit in a chair. We're going to hear this crazy guy from Southern California. You know, his wife's crazy. He's crazy. You know, he's yelling at us. He's German. You know I mean? Like, we could say all those things, but here's the thing. I want you to be different. I want you to commit to say, you know what? This is the, this is the launching pad of the greatest week. And I want you to wrestle with right now to commit to, if you want to commit to, it's not for everybody, I get it. But if you want to commit to saying, I want to live this week differently. I want people in my life to know that this is the week of all weeks. That I am part of the story of all stories. That this is about the gospel. If you want to live counterculturally, if you want to bless to be a blessing, if you want to remember, if you want to be somebody who invites other people into the story, here's what I want you to do. If this is you, I want you just to make a commitment to stand right where you're at. I'm going to live differently this week. This is an invitation into the journey. This week is going to be phenomenal. This is a week in which he promises the Holy Spirit. This is a week in which the, the Lord's Supper happens where he remembers his body been broken and blood being shed. This is the week. And man, I'm so excited. I, I, want, to, I want to come up here next weekend just to hear the stories of what happens this week. Praise Jesus. Lord, we come before you right now. Lord, look at your people. Lord, look at your people willing to, say, to be bold for you, willing to step out for you. Lord, would you give them conversations? Would you give them people like Jay just to remind them that the week is not about them, it's about you? Lord, would you allow them to be a blessing? Those that are generous, Lord, would you allow them to be just even more generous? 
Lord, would you allow them to use their gifts? Would you allow them to start ministries? Would you allow them to love the enemy, to love their neighbor as themselves? Lord, we pray that the city is different. As you wept over Jerusalem, Lord, we weep over Sacramento. This is a week that the city will know that the church, that you are alive and well. Lord, I pray that you just empower the people in this room. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.